Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. For everyone who's listened to episode 12 with Bernardo Castro, we thank you for the tremendous response that we've been getting from you. A lot of you have asked us uh, as to the release date of this particular episode, so it is now out. And anyone tuning in that has not heard episode 12, we highly recommend that you get hold of that episode first, as this is a continuation with none other than Bernardo Castro. So without taking too much more time, let's get straight into it. So yes, Bernardo, that's very interesting. And talking about evolution and moving from one species to the other, I think uh, we cannot let you go before we ask you about free will. And I think no philosopher has ever gone through an interview without having to answer this. So I think we want to get to know <laughs> a little bit about what you think about, because today there's this big de debate on, is it is the universe deterministic? Do I have free will? And uh, there are different ways to look at it. But uh, let's hear your take on this. Do you think that as humans, we have free will? I think it's very difficult to answer this question with a yes or a no, because I think the problem is more nuanced and to some extent it's a red herring. Let me try to share with you uh, what I think about it. Uh, when we think about free will, uh, in our minds conceptually, uh, free will is different from randomness uh, and it's also different from determinism. The problem is that there is nothing in between randomness and determinism. If our choices are random, you could, you could argue, well, we don't really have free will because we can't express our preferences. But if our choices are determined, then you would say, well, then we, we're not really free to choose because our choices are determined. You see what I mean? I think what we truly mean mm -hmm. with the intuition of, uh, of free will is the following. Um, are our choices determined by that which we identify with instead of external forces that we don't identify with. In other words, I am free to choose if my choices are determined, but determined by my preferences, my volition, my inclinations, my dispositions, as opposed to being determined by uh, um, the neurophysiology of my brain or cultural and social pressures and so on and so forth, things that I don't identify with. So free choices are determined, but they are determined by us individually as the agent who chooses. Now, if we define free will this way, uh, it is implicit in the definition that we exist as individual agents. Even the way you formulated your questions, are we free to choose as individuals? Then you have to ask yourself, do we truly exist as individuals? Because that's necessary to know whether we have free will as individuals. Um, and if I, would, if, 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 I, if I were to introspect now into what I can really choose about even my own inner life, I think it's very little. I don't choose my next thought. Uh, as Schopenhauer said, uh, um, um, uh, I am free to choose according to my will, but I'm not free to will what I will. <laughs> In other words, we can't right, really right. change our, our preferences. So to some extent, we as individuals seem to be sort of surfing on a giant wave much bigger than we are. And, it, and it's that giant wave that moves us in certain directions in life. Um, in classical Greek mythology, philosopher, sorry, classical Greek philosophy, uh, philosoph philosophers would talk about their daimons, not demons, daimons, uh, sort of muse mm -hmm. or the spirit that would enforce uh, uh, the directions they take in their lives, would even enforce the lines of thinking they would take. And from that perspective, we as individuals, I think we are more like tools of something bigger and transcendent that underlies our true identity as opposed to truly free agents. I mean, as I told you, I don't choose my thoughts. I think people with uh, uh, psychological problems, like I, I am an example of that, I, I, I have issues. Uh, I don't choose my neurosis. Uh, uh, I don't choose how I feel. Uh, I don't even choose really what I do in life. I mean, writing all these philosophy books has always felt to me as a sort of a, something I've been compelled to do, as a sort of responsibility, an obligation, um, not as something I 
do just because I enjoy doing it. And what I really enjoy doing is what I was doing just before I talked to you, which is uh, you know, hacking into old computers, designing computers. You know, it, that's my child self. It likes to express itself that way. Um, but uh, you know, philosophy is, is, is something that my diamond compels me to do. And um, so as an individual, I don't think I have much freedom. I think universal consciousness, by definition, is free to choose because it's all that exists. So there are no external forces that, that can impose choices on it. It's all there is. So whatever it chooses, uh, it is out of its freedom. And its freedom stems out of what it is. It chooses what it chooses because it is what it is. And that's completely internally defined or internally determined. And then by definition, it is free. But I as an individual, I think I am more a tool of that than, than a truly free agent. I have always had this feeling um, that, 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 that I'm serving something else, something bigger. And I'm not even unhappy with that because I think uh, uh, that's an incredible source of meaning. Um, the fact that I am surrendering my own individuality to serve something bigger than me that I can't even pin down. I don't even know what it is. I just feel its presence behind every move I make, every choice I make. Uh, I think it's, it's, it gives, it infuses my life with tremendous meaning. Even if I'm suffering, even if I am in pain, I always can remind myself, yes, I'm suffering right now, but I'm suffering for a reason because I'm I am a tool of something else, and I cannot comprehend that bigger plan, uh, but I trust and I feel in my bone that it is significant and it is uh, meaningful, and that allows you to bear uh, anything. Very true. I think a lot of us would identify with that, especially because the other end of the argument is about determinism or predeterminism. but. To me, determinism and predeterminism are both the same word. It, it's still determined by someone, right? Yes. And, and then the question is, it, is it determined by you as an individual? And then I would ask, do you even exist truly as an individual? <laughs> yeah, and that's interesting because uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the brain in a vat uh, thought or the experiment or the mind experiment, right? Yes. And uh, uh, in that scenario as well, if you are a brain or we are a brain in a vat and we are actively involved and connected, then the fact still remains that as an individual or as your bodily functions, those just can come and go. It doesn't matter whether you were uh, really tired yesterday or you will be tired tomorrow, but your mind knows that you are in a particular situation right now. You mm -hmm. cannot feel the tiredness of yesterday or you cannot expect or actually feel how, how tired you will be tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the life we live is to a large extent the narrative we tell ourselves, right? If we tell ourselves, oh, I only got two hours sleep, then I should be tired. And then guess what? You are tired. <laughs> I, I think, Joaquin, that uh, ultimately our freedom as individuals is the following. We can either surrender to that bigger thing that wants to express itself in the world through us, or we fight against it. That's the only choice we truly have. The choice is obvious, right? Which one is going to lead to more peace or more inner peace? So I Absolutely. think that's a, that's a very deep message as well. Especially because you can't win that fight. You can only tire yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's easier to fit in and after some time you'll get used to it rather than keep knocking and keep creating issues because that is creating more turmoil. But Exactly. And, and, and that links back to, to the example you gave of, of the clock. Uh, if we choose based on, uh, on our inner narratives, the conceptual narratives we tell ourselves about what we should want, where we should try to go, that's the moment when you disconnect from the rhythm uh, and the momentum of that thing that is behind you and which you ultimately are, and you try to, to impose uh, on nature uh, the illusory choices of the illusory individual you think you are. And that's like swimming against the current right. of a very strong river. You just tire yourself, eventually get yourself killed. Um, so I think dropping the narratives and just uh, attuning 
to, to the direction and the momentum of, of that which wants to express itself in the world through you, sort of surrendering your own, quote, free will as an individual and allowing yourself to, to, to just be used, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, but allowing yourself to be useful uh, to something bigger, uh, that is the choice we have. And ultimately, the, the impact of that choice is on ourselves. If you are going to swim against the current, good luck. Uh, otherwise, you know, just sense where the world is trying to go through you and then let that happen. Right, and let that happen. And the more you try to decode it, I think, the more uh, you're going to come up against because you don't really understand everything. I don't think we will ever understand anything. But for example, like you just said, you as a philosopher, you uh, you feel that uh, this is what you should be putting out. But I don't know whether you know to what end or what what is the consequence or reason for this, right? So like the famous saying goes, I uh, does a caterpillar know that it's going to be turning into a beautiful butterfly? It does not. Exactly. But it still is a caterpillar doing what it's doing. Exactly. That, that's why the choice is a leap of faith. To, to, to paraphrase uh, 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 Soren Kierkegaard, the, the Danish philosopher, uh, you have to make a leap of faith, uh, 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 allowing yourself to go along with whatever uh, the world is trying to go through you uh, without knowing exactly what the bigger plan is or even whether there is a bigger plan. So in that sense, you have to trust nature uh, and let yourself go with it uh, in a leap of faith. Um, we don't have better and better option because you said we don't know everything. I would go further and I would say we know very, very, very little, certainly not enough to capture the dynamics of what's going on in a conceptual narrative that we tell ourselves in order to justify our choices. We don't know either way. And those that think they know are the ones that know the least uh, because they don't even know how much <laughs> there is that they don't know. Um, so yeah, life in that sense is, is, a, is a game of surrender, a game of a leap of faith and, uh, and allowing things to manifest and, uh, and, and trying to be the best tool possible for that. We know very little. And if you look at the timeline of us knowing very little, I would assume we, we think that about 50,000 years ago, we started being able to conceptualize, get some form of language, and we were able to symbolically represent our thoughts. We are just talking about 50,000 years ago. Now, the universe or the plan of the universe or whatever the universe was thinking didn't start at that time. We started at that time. So for us to then say that, okay, from 50,000 years ago, I am going to either understand everything or from then it made sense. Because for the last 14.5 billion years, there was no sense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we are so young. We were born uh, uh, a second ago <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. We will never be able to capture reality in a narrative at our current point of uh, cognitive evolution. So, yeah, the, the leap of faith is is unavoidable. You can try to fight against it and you know, just tie yourself up and be a less good tool to whatever is trying to um, to 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 evolve or to express itself here through us. Um, or you, you know, after you hit your head against the wall enough times like I did, at some point you reach uh, a, 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 a point in your life in which you just realize, you know what, it, I don't need to understand everything. I just need to be attuned enough to sense uh, with my intuition, with my heart, uh, not only my conceptual thinking, uh, uh, where the flow is uh, is pushing me and and then just surrender to that and try to be the best tool possible to that to me that 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 has been my freedom um, in my midlife i've taken that decision i've made that choice to to allow it to to flow in the direction it wants to flow and not in the direction of my self-made conceptual little narrative using the symbolic thinking that I have evolved, as you said, 50,000 years ago. Maybe only, maybe even only 30,000. I think the jury is still out on that. But anyway, uh, a second ago in the universal scheme of things. And I think you uh, have given a great analogy in the fact, and I think that's where the problem is. The smart choices, like you said, banging your head against a wall and then deciding, okay, you know, this is where I need to get out. But unfortunately, what physics is telling us, if you keep banging your head against a wall, the possibility is that you will get through that wall. It is a slim possibility, but it w you will. And I think too many people are waiting for that to happen. So you keep banging your head on the wall because that's what it's saying. <laughs> 
Yeah, your whole life. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. We we live according. We, we try to achieve what the culture has told us uh, is the right life to have, but uh, you know, culture is a, an even younger phenomenon than symbolic thinking. Culture is what six thousand years old, maybe. I mean, what is the chance that the narrative culture tells you about what is a good life uh, is correct? I mean, we don't know anything. Uh, and to think that the good life is you know, to comply and study and get a good job and you know, raise a family and follow that script only despite of what uh, the energy within you uh, is, is, is pressing you to, to try and achieve um, is perhaps uh, naive, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, I'm not saying that we should all go haywire and become antisocial beings. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but often that energy inside us is not trying to do that either. It is original, it's unique in each one of us, uh, but it's not necessarily antisocial or, or criminal or anything like that. It's just that it's not necessarily conventional. Right. And I think even culture, like you mentioned, 6,000, even that is now being questioned. I, um, I'm not aware if you would know about the discoveries in Turkey, Gobeli, uh, Gobeli Tepe. And that is taking... That, that's right. Okay, so maybe maybe eleven, 11 yeah, eleven, or 12. 11 or twelve, and even that keeps getting pushed back. But I'm sure people listening to us are having a great time as well. But uh, what I'd like to do is, I have a lot of uh, listeners who've sent in questions, and I would like to ask you if you would like to spare some time here, and if I can ask those questions, and probably you could give us your thoughts on that. What it, w would you be okay to do that? Sure, let's do that. So. I'll start with uh, something that I've got from uh, my own mentor, and that is uh, Dr. Sedwin Fernandez, who's, who's actually been helping me to, or advising me and guiding and supporting me to do what I'm doing here with this podcast. And we have a common friend, and we'd like to ask you about this particular person, who is also a personal trainer. His name is Ali Sequeira. And recently, he's had to deal with many personal and medical challenges. He's just 37 years old. And he goes through dialysis three times a week. He is a physical trainer. He's financially mm -hmm. uh, independent, but he does these online uh, physical training classes for people as well as physically when he moves around, he is uh, teaching people. What we want to know is he is the most positive person any of us have ever met. What actually inspires such people? How, how are you able to change your level of consciousness to be that positive because I don't think it's deliberate or is it natural? I think it's natural. I think nature, nature has some clarity about where it's uh, trying to go. Um, and we are natural beings. We are part of that. I think to some extent, if that, if that positivity, that optimism, uh, is spontaneous, then it's not something you force with, uh, I don't know, affirmations and all this stuff that uh, that has developed in the West over the since the beginning of the New Thought movement, where this, the ego tries to become enlightened and take control of our lives as if the ego really existed. Um, I, I, I think there is an attempt to, to wrestle control of that and, and for the ego to sort of elevate itself and say, I'm changing my reality through positive thinking and affirmations. I, th I think that's one way to go about that, but I think that's hollow. Uh, it's not sustainable. Eventually, it's a house of cards that uh, collapses. And the other one is to just surrender. Just surrender to it. Don't try to wrap it all in a narrative and have a neat package that you can oversee. Uh, just go with it and sometimes that going with it is extraordinarily positive because the diamond in us um, has, that's my experience, it has zero interest in your ego, uh, whether it is the positive stories of your ego or the negative stories of your ego. It has zero regard for where your ego is trying to go, where your self-made narrative is telling you to go, it has an agenda of its own. So in his case, if that positivity is an expression of the impersonal in him, uh, that impersonal in him cares nothing about his kidneys. It doesn't consider that important at all, that he has to do dialysis three times a week. Yeah, okay, go there, spend some time in there. You need to do that. But it, it's not thinking about it. it, it it's not... Uh, um, 
uh, wasting its time and energy thinking about that. We all die one day. When that moment comes, it comes. But in the meantime, uh, we, we can either surrender to that which wants to express itself through us uh, or fight it and replace it with our inner narratives of either despair or, 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 or self, uh, self-affirmations of positivity. The message you're trying to put here is uh, give in to it rather than trying to control it. Right? Is that uh, what you're saying? Yes. Yes, because to control it, you need to understand it. Now, what's the chance that something that is 50,000 years old is going to understand something that is 13.8 or 7, I don't know what the latest number is, 13.8 billion uh, years old at least, if we can talk about time at all, because, you know, even time is a cognitive construction. So uh, I I think it's, it's extraordinarily naive to think that we can attain individual egoic control of what's going on, either in us or outside of us. But why do some people have so much of positivity? And is that natural? I think both are natural. I mean, some instances are artificial. You know, I mentioned self-affirmations, that, that's one. Some, some, some narratives of despair are also entirely illusory created by the ego. Um, but uh, let's ignore this artificiality for the moment. I think nature can express itself both in endless positivity or in endless negativity. I think both are natural. For instance, um, there are two philosophers uh, uh, I love, uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard and, uh, and, uh, and Arthur Schopenhauer. And they both, especially Kierkegaard, they, they both had extraordinarily uh, difficult lives. Uh, Kierkegaard was, nev- was never healthy. Uh, he battled uh, illness uh, his whole life. He died at 42. Um, Schopenhauer is well known for being a, a pessimistic philosophy. I don't think he was pessimistic. I just think that uh, he experienced the world in a, in, in, in a way that made him suffer. And he was very attuned to the suffering that permeates nature. He, he had uh, sort of magnifying glasses for suffering. He was keenly aware of the suffering. Um, and, and, and this negativity that pervaded their lives, uh, I think it was also natural because, you see, if you don't suffer, um, you do not think about the deeper questions. If we could all have lives of uh, unceasing leisure, Uh, we would never ask the deep questions about who we are, what's going on, what is this for. Um, Meaning would disappear. It would be obfuscated by banality, a pleasurable banality. So I think suffering is is one of the biggest tools of nature uh, to force us to to introspect. Uh, It stops us on our tracks and forces us to develop a level of self-awareness, a level of metacognition, Otherwise, we would be uh, uh, yeah, conscious creatures, but without any introspective capabilities at all. We would be like uh, conscious leaves in the wind. We wouldn't be examining our lives. And the, as the, 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 the philosopher said, uh, <laughs> or at least it's attributed to some philosopher, a, a, a li- an unexamined life is not a life worth living. Uh, and it's that that that, that mm. ability to examine life deeply uh, um, that is forced upon us uh, from suffering. So I think both suffering and positivity are are two sides of the same coin. They both can be very natural. I have a question here as well from uh, on our Instagram page. I I just have to tell you we've got more than fifty questions by the way. So so we have and and the age group, I think I've got to give you this as well. So the age group for all these questions or the people who listen to us well. mainly is between 12 to 26. So that's 90% of our listeners. That's the future. I have a question here from uh, Singh1743. That's his Instagram uh, name. And he says, how can we connect ourselves with the subconscious and unconscious of our mind? Um, For me, it has been and continues to be a constant attempt at surrender, a constant attempt at stopping uh, the judgmental narratives about myself, um, a constant uh, attempt to stop 
what I tell myself is going on in me or who I am or what I'm supposed to like or not like or what I'm supposed to try to achieve in my life. Uh, it, I'm always trying to become aware metacognitively of these uh, traps, of these narratives and constantly letting them go. And it's not a process, at least for me, that has ever come to an end. Um, I, I have never achieved the point where, okay, now I have let go of all of that. No, it reasserts itself very quickly. So for me, it's a continuous process of becoming metacognitively aware of it and letting it go. Um, uh, one special thing for me, and, but, but that's me, I'm not sure it's applicable to anybody else. Uh, since I've turned 40, and I'm, I'm almost 46 now, um, reconnecting with the non-verbal inner life of my child self uh, has become a big thing, has become a big tool, uh, reconnecting with the things I liked when I was younger and um, the, the spontaneous pleasure I had being in nature without any goal, without any path to follow or any height to reach in the mountains, you know, any specific point, just you no, know, fully around uh, in nature, in, in forest. I, I, I was fortunate enough to have been born and, and have had my childhood in, in Rio de Janeiro, which, I mean, the city itself is, is a urban catastrophe, but my family had uh, some land outside the city, uh, which was forested, and, and, and it was fantastic. I, I remember those years with a lot of fondness. Um, and, and reconnecting with simple pleasures of when I was uh, a child, like uh, retro computing, video games, you know, this, this apparently by now things that still have life in them. And reconnecting with that, I feel, allows me to reconnect with my true, you know, basis uh, self that, uh, that uh, the, the, your, 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 your viewer uh, called the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind. I don't think these terms are the best ones, but I understand what he means by that. It's reconnecting with the spontaneity within us, the pre-verbal spontaneity within us. That's, that's what has worked for me. For, for Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, he liked to play with the pebbles on a lakeshore take a, a, a stick of wood and just, you know, draw little canals and uh, build little cities with the pebbles uh, from the lake shore. And he did that as, as a 40-year-old man. So now everybody has a technique. Right. And you just said uh, you grew up in Rio de Janeiro and I was just thinking. So one of the things, or I'm assuming one of the things that would connect you to your childhood, all of us here in India would think would be football. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm. Um, I didn't uh, absorb enough enough Brazilianness. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, no. So football was not a big thing for me, and uh, samba also not. And coffee, I don't drink coffee. So okay. yeah, it, um, I, I didn't really. Uh, how to say that the, the rest of the culture didn't um, come to me through osmosis. Um, hmm. the, the, there is a sense in which I'm, you know pretty European in outlook, but, uh, but the nature, the nature there was, uh, and, and that's something I know only now, because when I was a kid, that nature was, was the world, it's how it was, you know, <laughs> right. and then later on I realized, oh, I, actually, it was a privilege for me to have had those years, you know, and I, I don't take it for granted. Wow. And I have a few questions here. Uh, I think that you've already answered them. So, the eternal soul, I have IDC Pro, who was asking about uh, consciousness and, and the definition of it. We've answered that. Uh, Aryan25580 also talks about uh, what is consciousness. So, we've covered that in our talk earlier. I have an interesting one here, if you would want to answer, from Rishi MTLWR017. And that is, does losing consciousness happen only after death and can our brain be unconscious without any thoughts after death? I don't think we ever lose consciousness. Um, people like to refer to things like, you know, if you pass out, you lose consciousness. If you undergo general anesthesia, you lose consciousness. If you sleep and you don't dream, you lose consciousness. Um, and more and more we're realizing that no consciousness is lost. The only thing you lose is the ability to remember what was in your consciousness in those times. 
uh, you may wake up in the morning and think, oh, I've been just unconscious for seven or eight hours. And then later in the day, you remember all kinds of dreams that you've had, you've had during the night. So you lost the memory of consciousness, not consciousness. And in fact, we cannot really tell ever for sure that we lost consciousness because you may have just lost the memory of having been conscious. Uh, there, there is new research now, quite recent, that indicates very strongly that we are always conscious during sleep, even when we are not dreaming. So they, they provided a list of three or four different types of sleep experience next to dreams. You could have, for instance, a, 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 a selfless sleep experience that the researchers compared to certain meditative states. You can have sleep thinking. In other words, you are actually thinking during sleep, but uh, that thinking is not immersive, so it's not a dream. So all kinds of things could be happening. We know that uh, some people perceive what's happening in the operating room while they are uh, under uh, uh, general anesthesia. Um, so that's also a little older research, so that's more established than the dream part. Uh, we also know that... Um, when we pass out, um, for instance, by partial strangulation, uh, we can have uh, enormously rich transcendent experiences. And that's why teenagers worldwide have invented a very dangerous game that no teenager, nobody should ever do, called the choking game, in which they undergo partial strangulation to basically have a psychedelic trip. Uh, while they seem to, to have uh, passed out, anybody looking from the outside would say, well, they've just passed out. But uh, consciousness is continuing. Uh, it just changes. It's change, it changes in content. It changes in configuration. And I think the same thing happens upon our death. The death, for me, is the end of a dissociative process in universal consciousness. Uh, so um, life is the dissociation. Death is the end of it. And the end of a, of a dissociation only means the enrichment uh, of the contents of consciousness. Maybe we we realize that we are not those individuals that we thought we were in the same way that when we wake up in the morning we realize that we were not the dream avatar we were the mind that was conjuring up the whole dream the avatar and the world of the avatar um, but we remain conscious when we wake up i think by by analogy the same thing happens when we die uh, our the configuration of our consciousness changes the contents of our consciousness changes a uh, change uh, our uh, uh, understanding of self-identity probably changes in the same way that it changes when we wake up from a dream but consciousness continues i don't think it ever stops would it be different from before we were born because you were still part of uh, everything but just the fact that you now live a particular life or you get disassociated from something and then you go back how would you compare it to before you were born you were you're still part of it if we think in terms of time, which is necessary because that's how our cognition works, we have to surrender to, to, to that idea of space and time. So in the context of time, I think it changes because uh, you, you've had a whole life. Uh, um, there are so many new insights, so many new understandings and experiences that of course it changes. It, it, it has become enriched. Uh, now it, some of its potentials are now manifest that before were not manifest. Of course, everything by definition exists in potentiality, but the question is, uh, uh, is more of it manifest after a lifetime? I would say absolutely. I mean, uh, my, my inner life now is very different than uh, 26 years ago, uh, when I was 20 years old. Uh, it's the same consciousness, it, it, it never stopped, but uh, my understanding, my, 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 my outlook, the way I feel myself and the world are, are radically enriched and changed. And I think the same applies for, for the end of life. Mm. True. Uh, I have something here from IDC Bro 2. If, uh, alien, if we did find some alien uh, race uh, in some part of the universe, the, would it be necessary that their consciousness would have evolved in the same <laughs> way as ours? And or would it be a different uh, evolution of consciousness? Or does, well, I, I guess the question is, the evolution of consciousness, is it the same or does it follow just one pattern? I would be surprised if it were the same everywhere. Um, I, I suspect that uh, ultimately we are all 
tending towards higher levels of uh, metacognition and self-awareness. I suspect that this is a basic template of nature. It's what nature is pushing towards. It's the instinctive goal of nature uh, to, to, to develop these higher levels of metacognition. In other words, to become explicitly aware of its own uh, conscious inner life. Um, but there are many paths leading, uh, leading to, to Rome, right? There are many roads leading to the same destination. And by taking these different roads, uh, uh, even if they all reach the same point, they bring different things with them when they reach that point. So I would, I, I would be surprised if everybody were taking the same road towards metacognition. I would expect an, a potential alien race to, to, to be developing their consciousness in potentially uh, very different ways. Um, we don't even need to go to alien races. I mean, even on Earth, there are animals, mammals very related to us, but which seem to be developing their consciousness uh, in, in a very different way. Think of cetaceans, uh, dolphins and whales. They have brains bigger than ours. I would imagine that they have sophistic sophisticated consciousness as well, but not consciousness oriented towards uh, uh, manipulation of nature like ours is. We are very oriented towards manipulating nature through tools, technology, um, predictive models, things that we call science, for instance. Uh, we are very oriented to that, to the manipulation of nature, and they don't seem to be oriented towards that at all. Uh, and then you ask yourself, why do they have those gigantic brains with lots of folds? And some may say, well, what matters is the ratio between brain volume and body volume. And I understand all that. But at the end of the day, they have much bigger brains than we do. Uh, than we do. So I would imagine that even they, so related to us on the same planet, also mammals, uh, are taking a very, very different path to conscious uh, evolution. Uh, now, if you start talking about amphibians and, and insects, uh, yeah, even on this planet, uh, there, are, there is a lot of variety. Uh, so I, I would be surprised if everything were the same elsewhere. Right. You interestingly mentioned manipulation of nature and, you know, it just connected to something that we spoke about 10 minutes ago, which was banging your, your head against the wall. And that reminds me of manipulation of nature. That's pretty much what that could be. So the bigger brains in the dolphins, it's just that realization or the maturity to understand that you cannot manipulate uh, nature because that's going to be a dead end. <laughs> but we have the power to kill them. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, I, yeah, I think it's very difficult for any one of us to really explicitly conceive of their inner life, uh, really making sense of what's going on in those gigantic brains and, and why do they have those gigantic brains? Um, you know, the, the, the brain to, to body volume ratio is, is, is an empirical thing. It's a rule of thumb. It doesn't really explain why they need the gigantic brain and what's going on in it. Um, maybe the, even the very question, should I go along with nature or should I try to dominate and manipulate nature instead? Maybe even the question doesn't arise in their consciousness. Um, and what does arise in their consciousness, the questions that do arise, maybe are uh, unfathomable to us. We can't even imagine, we can't even conceive of the questions they are dealing with, uh, of the evolution they are uh, undergoing. They, they, these may be uh, incommensurable uh, worlds uh, of consciousness. And, and, and look, they are extremely similar to us. You know, we all have roughly the same organs. We all breathe air, although they are in water and, and we are on, 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 on ground, uh, uh, dry ground. Um, so we are incredibly similar uh, if you think of the similarity in a universal context. Now, uh, what aliens might be undergoing, what they might be oriented towards, uh, oh, I can't even begin to think about that, but I would fully expect it to be totally different. Mm. And I think this ties in well to what uh, Rajat Patel, one, is asking you now. Uh, are there any other dimensions and how is consciousness related to these dimensions? So when you talk about, when we talk about a dolphin and we talk about a human, we are both in the same dimension and we, we, we still can't understand each other as far as what are the thoughts are concerned. But when you talk about moving forward in consciousness, does that automatically get connected or related to moving into 
dimensions or staying in the dimension that you are and uh, evolving your consciousness further? Um, I am with Kant and Schopenhauer and the Western tradition in general, uh, except for 20th century and 21st century physics, um, in, in thinking of space and time as cognitive constructs. Uh, they are the scaffolding of our cognition. They don't exist objectively out there. Um, and dimensions are just a way to, to describe certain configurations of consciousness, let me put it that way. Um, I don't believe in parallel physical worlds for the reason that physics today mostly postulates them, in other words, to make sense of certain uh, uh, experimental results in quantum mechanics related to quantum entanglement uh, that seem to defy physical realism, that seem to defy the idea that there is an objective physical world out there. And to save that objective physical world, some physicists prefer to say, well, then there are infinite objective physical worlds uh, in which everything that can happen actually does happen. So I don't believe in that story. I think it's a fairy tale. I think it's motivated uh, to allow us to hold on to something that we now know experimentally was an illusion, the illusion of an objective physical world constituted of objects with defined physical properties such as size, position, momentum, weight, and so on. Uh, I think we should just accept that nature is telling us that's, that's not what she is, instead of conjuring up these little magical fairy tales of parallel universes to save an illusion. Now, for that reason, I don't think we should believe in parallel universes, but I think we may have good other reasons to, to think that there may be other dreams going on in consciousness which we could describe accurately as parallel dimensions. I accept that possibility. I don't think the human ability to cognize only four dimensions, three of space and one of time, uh, uh, entails that uh, only four dimensions actually exist. I think the limitation is almost certainly a limitation of how our cognitive apparatus uh, has evolved, not a limitation of nature itself. The fact that we can only see this doesn't mean that only this exists. So I am very open to the idea of what we may describe as other dimensions, uh, which you could also describe as uh, other dissociated dreams within universal consciousness uh, might exist. Um, so in that sense, uh, the four dimensions are what the human cognitive apparatus has evolved to pick out from the world because those four seem to be particularly relevant to our survival. And if there are 11 instead of four, but everything going on in the other seven doesn't seem to affect much uh, our uh, body integrity, then we wouldn't have evolved to pick them out. We wouldn't have evolved to perceive them because it would only increase confusion and not lead to any survival advantage. So I think the four dimensions are an artifact of uh, uh, survival advantages, of uh, uh, evolutionary advantages over time. They tell us uh, about our cognitive apparatus more than they tell us about the richness of the world out there. Um, but the limitation is a tool for consciousness evolution. I mean, Jung talked about it in his book, Answer to Job. Um, uh, if you are not subject to limitation, uh, you're never stopped on your tracks and forced to contemplate your situation. And then you never develop metacognition. So perhaps this limitation to four dimensions uh, plays an, a role in the instinctive strive of nature to become aware, explicitly aware of itself. I don't know, for, for all I know, the limitation plays a role. It, it, it has a meaning, it has a significance, uh, but we should understand it as our limitation, not a limitation of whatever is objectively out there. Maybe the bigger brain in the dolphin we just spoke about, but that bigger brain could be <clears throat> the other seven dimensions that you just spoke about, or in some way, being able to tune into those. Perhaps, uh, you know, if, if you are a higher dimensional being and you're moving in a higher dimensional space, we can imagine it by thinking of flatland, you know, that thought experiment where we imagine a two-dimensional world on a sheet of paper. Even a sheet of paper is actually three-dimensional. So if you imagine a 3D apple, 
uh, going through the sheet of paper from the perspective of the flatlanders li uh, living on the sheet of paper, that apple would appear as a little dot and then that dot would grow, 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 grow into a circle and then it would shrink again until it disappears. So from their perspective, something would come out of nothing, grow and then suddenly disappear into nothingness again and they would be mind boggled by, by, the, by the orange or the apple going through the, their two dimensional world. Now we don't seem to have this in our world. There don't seem to be 4D or 5D objects crossing our world because to us that would appear as magic and our world seems to be fairly continuous and um, uh, the same applies for dolphins they don't pop out of nowhere and disappear <laughs> into mm. nowhere so i don't think they are five-dimensional beings now the question is could they intuitively through their capacity for imagination gain access to other dimensions uh, beyond the dimensions in which they themselves as organisms exist, that could very well be. I don't know. It's difficult to say. Mm. And Bernardo, you have this very strange knack of somehow answering a question before I can ask it, and you, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I was I was looking at the question while you were talking, you touched on dreams, and I have uh, Rishikesh Hadu who asks you, what is the purpose of dreams? Do, do dreams have uh, do, I mean, would you know, is there a reason why we dream or is it just some kind of a download or it's a leak in our, in our mind? Or, but does it have a purpose? Is, what do you think? I think dreams reflect uh, the, the, the I, I, I was going to say, the, the under layers of our true selves, but under has a, seems to have a connotation of being inferior and that's not what I mean at all. Um, the more foundational layers of ourselves. Uh, there are always processes unfolding in those foundational layers of, of ourselves. Um, and those processes are natural processes. They are manifestations of what we are. Um, it's just that evolution has forced us to focus our attention on certain survival relevant tasks and modes of operation that have obfuscated those more foundational layers of ourselves. They have become obfuscated because, you know, we, we have to operate in a functionally efficient way uh, in the world. And that may involve repressing uh, the more foundational layers of ourselves. But those layers are always there and they, they, they are always unfolding because that, that's how we are. Uh, our minds are spontaneous things and there are processes constantly unfolding in them and I think we uh, uh, attain contact, explicit contact with those foundational layers through dreams. When our attention is low, uh, when our need to operate metacognitively in the world uh, is reduced, uh, and, and having that contact with our own source seems to be incredibly, incredibly important for our health. Because if you don't sleep for only a few days, you, you die. I think it's uh, in the order of two weeks. I don't remember anymore what research is, but what the research says. But if you don't sleep, even though you're eating, you're drinking, you have enough energy in your body, enough calories, uh, uh, you die. So somehow, going back to those foundational layers are like watering the plant that we are. We, we need that nurturing contact. Um, and that's what happens during dreams. Do they have an explicit uh, uh, goal in the sense that somebody somewhere or a part of ourselves explicitly planned out a message to be conveyed to us? I don't think that's, that's how it works. I think, I think it, it is spontaneous, uh, but it has a message. It has a spontaneous message, and the message is, look, pay attention. This is what you are actually feeling, thinking, or imagining, or, or being afraid of. Uh, th this is your true self that, uh, that's being repressed by your metacognitive self that needs to survive in the world. That's the message, and it, it's a spontaneous message. Uh, my motivation for saying this, uh, in, you know, uh, in depth psychology, some, some people ask, uh, if dreams have a message, why, why doesn't the dreaming mind just say that in English? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just say that. Why, why to make it so complicated, so symbolic? And Carl Jung once said, 
Well, obviously, those foundational layers of mind can't speak English. They, they don't have that language. So they are spontaneous. Uh, it's the upper layers that have developed symbolic thinking uh, through language and con concepts and all that. The underlying layers are more connected to, 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 the, to the umbilical cord of nature, to our roots. We are natural beings. We are rooted in nature. And those layers don't have language. They are closer to source. Uh, they, they, they unfold spontaneously. So in that sense, they have a message, and the message is a mirror. You know, the mirror is saying, underneath the layers that you're paying attention to, this is what's going on in you. This is what you really are. That's a big part of yourself. Uh, ignore it at your, at your own peril. And here's an interesting question from, I guess his name is Amish. And his question is about when people talk about spiritualism or when people talk about uh, controlling the energy in our minds. It works well with controlling the the body flow as well on how your body works. So I think the question here is mind over matter kind of a question. And then I can control my mind to manifest certain realities in my life or, or with my health. Then it should work as well. Depends on how well I do it. I think the body is just the, the extrinsic appearance of certain layers of our own minds that we don't have explicit introspective access to. Um, some people call that the unconscious layers and, and the appearance of the unconscious layers is your body and the appearance of your conscious or metacognitive layers is uh, certain patterns of brain activity uh, in your head. Um, but I think all matter the, in the universe, and certainly all matter in our body, not only the matter in our brain, uh, is the image, the extrinsic appearance, the representation of our own mental processes. And the fact that we can't expi explicitly introspect into the processes that correspond to the rest of our body doesn't mean that they aren't mental. They are also mental, we just are unable to bring them into the field of self-reflection, the field of metacognition, such that we can experience them, not only that, but we can also experience knowing that we are experiencing them. That level of explicit introspection is not possible, uh, but I think the body, just like certain mental processes in the brain, is also the appearance of uh, experiences that are ours, experiences that we are. Um, from that perspective, uh, the repressed layers of your mind, your repressed feelings, your repressed fears, regrets, uh, dreams, wishes, whatever uh, is part of you, but you're not metacognitively or explicitly aware of, expresses itself as bodily processes. Um, so from that perspective, what happens in the body is essentially mental. Whether you can introspect into it or not, it's essentially mental, which go, could, could go a long way into making sense of the placebo effect. Uh, we know the effect exists. It's acknowledged uh, unanimously in science because the evidence is just too overwhelming to, to reject it. It's actually a big commercial problem now because drugs are only approved uh, when they work better than the placebo effect that works as reference. And the placebo effect is getting better and better and better. So it's a big problem for drug companies to, to get approval for new medicines because they are hardly better than the placebo, even though they work. So uh, that's what I think the body is. But, but then the question translates into the following. Does your metaconscious self, in other words, your ego, that part of yourself that you not only experience, you know that you experience it, can it, as one part of you, exert control over all the rest of you? That I doubt. I think the ego is, in fact, standing on the ground uh, of those uh, more foundational layers of our minds. It has no existence without that. It, it gets its nurture from that. So I don't think it can take control uh, of everything. Um, if anything, it's the other way around. Uh, somebody can interpret many um, psychotic uh, um, states as uh, the ego being overwhelmed by the foundational layers underneath that don't follow the same logic, that don't have the same agenda, are, are not telling themselves in the same narrative. They are spontaneous, not, not, uh, uh, not um, 
planned out uh, in action. So I think if anything, our, our egos can be overwhelmed by the so-called, quote, unconscious, but I don't think the ego can control the unconscious because the unconscious is bigger, more intense and more powerful uh, on the basis of we can observe. But but it can influence uh, Joaquim. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Right. Sorry to interrupt you. I think the ego can influence it if the ego can establish a relationship of respect and non-judgment with the so-called unconscious or foundational layers of our minds. If there can be a relationship of respect without judgment, because the ego has this enormous tendency of judging the unconscious as inappropriate, immoral, evil dirty, whatever. I mean, we always have a, a, a cultural narrative that excludes other things that are natural, uh, but considered inferior or undesirable. So if you can refrain from that judgment, which doesn't mean that you're going to act out your unconscious out there, that's not, that's not what I'm promulgating. I'm promulgating an acceptance, a integral acceptance of what we truly are, without rejection, without repression, if that respectful relationship of these different parts of ourselves can come in place, then I think a dialogue uh, uh, can, can unfold in which influence is exerted without domination, without control. Uh, and that, I think, is a feasible goal. Would that, would that also be the basis of meditation, right? That's what you're trying to achieve, what you just said. There are many forms of meditation, right? I mean, uh, your, your culture is uh, world-leading um, in that. Um, I think in the West, which is what I have better references for, meditation can be used in radically different ways. Some people meditate to control the unconscious, to, a to attain domain over the unconscious and that that's a repressive thing that that has to do with you know the, the western tendency to try to control nature and not only nature outside but nature within ourselves and that i think is i think is ultimately flawed and uh, unhealthy and uh, and it can't succeed other forms of meditation uh, are about uh, eliminating the mind at all its levels and achieving a sort of empty mind state or empty conscious state in which there is nothing going on, just a sort of a very calm lake without wind, without waves, without nothing. I think that's possible, um, but I don't think it's natural for us to live in that state. I, I think we are here to experience things. So uh, going to that state now and then as a sort of opportunity to recharge and recover perspective, that's valid but I don't think it's a natural state if one wants to be continuously there. And there are forms of meditation that want precisely to evoke uh, the foundational layers, to let them express themselves. For instance, active imagination is a Western form of meditation um, that aims at uh, uh, allowing the so-called unconscious to, to manifest itself to the ego and say, okay, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm thinking, uh, uh, heed, take, take, take heed of this, uh, uh, listen to this, because that's also part of mm. you. And, and if you repress it, uh, I will hurt you. Uh, and, 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 and I will hurt you means uh, um, I will make you sick, but not in, the sense, uh, not in the sense that I said, this is a metaphor the way I said it. What I mean is, if we do not respect what's going on in the foundational layers of our mind, our conscious processes there will become dysfunctional. And the image, the appearance of that dysfunction will be a physical condition. And guess what? That's what we, at least in the West, but now and the West has contaminated the whole world now. So Western illnesses are everywhere. Western dysfunctionality is now everywhere. Um, that's what the Western culture sort of has been doing uh, in, in the attempt to control everything, including ourselves. Uh, um, it's uh, forcing the foundational layers of our mind to become dysfunctional, to lose balance. Uh, and, and the image of that is physical illness, which could account for uh, the growth in all kinds of illnesses that we are statistically measuring now uh, in the world. You also mentioned that uh, at some time, when you were speaking about consciousness earlier, there's a question from Jagan Chauhan here, there's a question from Ikandu Nukala and Avant Pandey, the big beard man also asking you a question. And 
nothing can move faster than the speed of light. But consciousness can, right? I guess the question here is related to spins. Yeah, I think I understand. He's talking about quantum entanglement and instantaneous interaction at a distance. Um, how do I tackle this? I, I think science, sorry, I think physics is a science of perceptions. It's an attempt to study, model, and predict the, the, the dynamics of the contents of perception. Physics is not trying to model thoughts or feelings. Physics is modeling what we see, what we hear, what we touch. That's what physics is. And those models are mathematical equations that describe, characterize, and predict the behavior of what is on the screen of perception. Even when we use uh, instruments to enhance perception, like microscopes, telescopes, uh, oscilloscopes, <laughs> or, or, or large accelerators like the one I used to work uh, uh, at. Um, these are tools to enhance perception because they are only useful insofar as we perceive their outputs, insofar as we perceive what is on the telescope, what is on the computer screen, uh, or what is on the LEDs blinking on an instrument. So physics is a science of perception, enhanced or unenhanced. And it's in that context that we should interpret everything physics says, including the speed of light limit. The speed of light limit is the limit to what can be experienced on the screen of perception. It's not a limit that applies to, to mind in its integral uh, uh, self, in its integral, integral being. Uh, it, it's a limitation, a theoretical limitation, that applies to a particular modality of experience, namely perception, because that's what physics studies. Now, within that same context, we know that quantum entanglement prevents us from describing entangled, entangled particles separately from each other, irrespective of their distance. One can be in one side of the universe, the other in the other side, and we still have to describe them as a whole, as a set, not as two different particles. And one way to interpret this is to say, well, they are exchanging signals at speeds higher than the speed of light. I think that's a flawed interpretation. Um, I think what this is telling us is much more fundamental than superluminal communication. What it is telling us is that the universe at its most foundational layers cannot be seen, be seen as a set or a collection of parts. It has to be seen as one integrated whole. It cannot be described as uh, the compound behavior of parts. It can only be descri described as an integral whole. That's what I think uh, quantum entanglement is telling us. The universe is one thing. It's one whole on. It's, it, it's not a sum of parts. It's not a collection of little things. It's one thing that presents itself to us on the screen of, per of perception according to a certain image. And then... It is our convenience, our epistemic convenience, that uh, pushes us to describe it in terms of separate objects. But the boundaries between objects is nominal. It doesn't exist out there. It is uh, 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 something that's useful to us, and therefore we apply it. Like you say, well, the boundaries of the car are the windshield, the tires, and beyond that, uh, and the chassis, and beyond that, it's not car. But you know what? The car doesn't work without the rest. Uh, if there were no air to allow for, for, for combustion, the car wouldn't work. Uh, uh, if there weren't a road for the tires to grip, the car wouldn't move. If there wasn't gravity to pull the car to the road, <laughs> the car wouldn't move. Uh, the inanimate universe, at least, is one whole, not a sum of parts. And I think that's what quantum entanglement is telling us. Now, the speed of light limit is just a, a way to describe uh, certain regularities of the behavior of that one whole. That's all there is to it. A question here from the crazy creature. Very simple questions, which actually I would all we, we did talk talk about it, but I, I didn't uh, get a very clear, easy answer. What happens to our consciousness when we sleep? I think we go back to the foundational layers of ourself. 
things about ourselves that when we are awake, we are not in touch with because those layers of ourselves become obfuscated uh, by the, the world of meta consciousness going about uh, about life. Um, it's a sort of a return to source, return to to the roots of ourselves and and the part that is awake and interacting with the world. That's the leaves, so to say. It's the it's the the youngest parts of 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 ourselves as individuals, the more developed ones that have you know developed the highest levels of metacognition, self awareness, uh, but which are also function oriented because that's what evolution pushed us to become. Um, and and the roots, the parts that we go back in touch with uh, during dreams, during sleep, uh, those are, are our roots, the more, the, the more authentic, least developed parts of ourselves. And I say least developed, not in a negative sense, but in the sense of higher authenticity. Uh, um, and it, it's so easy to lose contact with that and to forget where we came from and where we are rooted. We are rooted in nature, in the spontaneity of nature. It's very, it's very easy to become spiritual in the sense of becoming airy, uh, going to a world of pure abstraction and losing touch with our own humanity, our, our, our animal nature, even our veg vegetable nature in the sense of being rooted in the metaphorical ground of experience. That's where we go, I think, when we sleep, when we dream. And, 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 and when we are in certain meditative states, which require a lot of self-awareness, uh, things related to self-inquiry, for instance, in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, we go to the other extreme, which, which is also important. It, it's also integral to us. The spiritual extreme is also integral to us. And, 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 but it, it's nice to, to take care of the roots as well and to go back to the roots as well and remind ourselves where we came from. But I think it, it is kind of nourishment for us, right? It's, it's a nourishment for, for the soul, if you can call it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, interrupted you. It, 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 nourishment, that's the right word. You got it. Yeah. Right. And I have a few more questions here, Krishna. Miss 1254, the crazy creature we just asked. Amish, Rana, Tejas, Mr. Cosmos, uh, Shagun. There's an interesting question here from the Golden Ratio. Uh, 1.618, well, that's his name. And he says, can consciousness be transferred to an external device? And does or could consciousness be transferred from one brain to another brain? It's a very dualistic uh, question, right? It assumes that consciousness is a property of some kind of material arrangement that itself is not consciousness. Uh, exactly. And then you can transfer that property or that thing from one box to another. Um, I think consciousness is what there is. Consciousness is the box. Everything else exists in consciousness. Mm. So I don't think you can transfer consciousness because consciousness is the space wherein everything else might be transferred if you know what I mean. Consciousness is the context, context where, uh, where certain particular contents of consciousness are transferred. It, 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 it itself is the ground of being. It's not amenable to, be, to being transferred because uh, where is it going to go? It's what there is. It's the one thing that exists. Where can it go? <laughs> right. Absolutely. And uh, we also have a few questions here from Lepsi Day and Sharuk 5896, uh, why do negative thoughts come to uh, our minds without our permission? Because the thing that, yeah, yeah, it, it's because the thing, the thing that thinks it can give permission <laughs> um, is, a, is a small aspect of, of, of what we are. Uh, those negative thoughts are also part of us and and they clamor for recognition and th the easiest way to have your life go really wrong is to deny and repress those parts of us that don't make our ego comfortable because what will happen is once you repress them they go stealth they will operate under the surface of your explicit awareness and they will have free domain right there because you're not paying attention uh, you are not looking at them 
So they will have free domain. They will grow in energy. Uh, the, 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 the separation imposed by your ego will, will, will just feed them. And one day they will jump out on you when you least expect and make you do something that would horrify yourself if you could be watching it from, from, from the outside. That's how they get to us, is when we repress them and we make them invisible. Um, they, then they will undermine us from within. They will either make us sick or they will suddenly change uh, our behavior in a completely uncharacteristic way at some point. They will make us sort of go nuts, go haywire, go berserk at a certain moment. And, and that one moment can be defining for your life. It can throw you in jail for 20 years. It can cause a divorce. Uh, it can hurt someone you like, someone you love. Um, so th this 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 uh, paradigm of the ego attaining control is a domineering paradigm that uh, is not natural. It it, it 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 is not compatible with the spontaneous flow of nature. Um, if you don't want to screw yourself up then don't let those parts of yourself, those parts of yourself that make you uncomfortable, don't let them go uh, underwater. Don't let them become submarines that will shoot at you without your knowing. Uh, allow them to be recognized. You don't need to act them out. But if you just accept them as legitimate parts of yourself, uh, they will not get more energy than they need to have. They are not going to grow and fester uh, within us. The more you fight a so-called negative thought, the stronger it becomes. H have you ever noticed that? That the more you fight it, the stronger it becomes, the harder it becomes, the more it sort of uh, dominates your life. Uh, but if you don't make it a big issue and you just say, okay, I'm having this negative thought now, that's all right. It's also part of who I am. I, I, I accept that this is happening. I accept that this is nature. I don't need to like it. Not liking it is natural, uh, but it, it doesn't mean that you have to kick it uh, downstairs, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You don't need to kick it downstairs. Uh, keep it visible. You know, Stay close to your friends, closer yet to your yeah. enemies. There, 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 is, there is some, some sense to this, to this saying. Uh, uh, grant them recognition uh, uh, for their existence and, and let them become a part of you. And the moment you do that, paradoxically enough, is the moment when you will feel that you can, quote, control them. You're not controlling them at all. You're just, them, you're just allowing them to be. But it, you, it will feel like you can control them that way. And it will have the same effects that you would have if you could actually control them, which you can't. One part of you cannot control another part of you. One part of nature cannot extinguish another part of nature. They both exist as parts of nature. Uh, but that's the, that, that's the way to achieve uh, harmony, at least for me. That's my own personal experience. There are parts of me that I am ashamed of. Well, not anymore. I'm not really ashamed of anymore of anything. But uh, there are parts of me that I would prefer that they weren't there. But I know they are there and I accept them. And so it, it, there's less tension uh, in my life since, since I've sort of surrendered, surrendered to the reality of all the parts of myself, so to say. And they are not even parts, they are integral to myself, but uh, allow me to use this linguistic metaphor of parts. Uh, the moment I accepted all of my parts is the moment when the, my inner tension has reduced the most. It's not zero, there's still tension but uh, I'm not at uh, all-out war against myself anymore. Mm. And I think you've very well described uh, what we use in the corporate world at the moment uh, that has been picking up uh, emotional intelligence. And the, the main emphasis for emotional intelligence has always been you need to identify and accept your emotions first, whether it's a negative emotion or whether it's an emotion you're trying to hide or suppress. So. Uh, I, I guess that's very similar to what you just said. Yeah, and I think, look, I think this is a, 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 one of the best measures of human maturity uh, is one's ability to accept uh, all aspects of oneself. When one is insecure and immature, what you get is um, strong, dogmatic approaches to life, strong judgment, like uh, black and white positive and negative, what should and what shouldn't. People that go on on a podium and tell everybody else how they should live. Uh, 
Uh, often this is coupled with a very moralistic way of seeing the world, of uh, a very judgmental way of seeing the world, like saying that, um, um, I don't know, people from other races or people from other sexual dispositions uh, are, are wrong and evil and all that. I think this is a straight measure of uh, insecurity and immaturity. Insecurity in the sense that you are afraid of what you are criticizing because you know subliminally you have all of that in yourself and you're very afraid of it and your way of dealing with that fear of the parts of yourself that you hate is to preach to the world that they should all hate it as well. Uh, it's a way of trying to attain an, an illusion of, of security. But it, it, paradoxically, it, uh, it broadcasts to the world how fearful and insecure you actually are. And immature as well, because I think maturity has a lot to do not with becoming better, but with accepting what, what we are and have been from the beginning. I think that's what maturity is. It, it, it's, it's acceptance, not true fundamental improvement. Right, and there's a question here for you, directly for you from Lavanya Kulgal. And um, um, let me see how you're going to answer this one. Uh, why can't the world's greatest minds, so that's he, one of them is going to be you, so why can't the gr world's greatest minds solve the mystery of consciousness? <laughs> because the problem is, when we talk about the mystery of consciousness, what most people mean by that is we don't have an explanation or a reduction of consciousness, an explanation for consciousness in terms of something else that isn't consciousness. And that's why consciousness is a mystery. We can't reduce it to something else. Uh, we can't explain it in terms of something else. But guess what? Of course we can't, because consciousness is that in terms of which we explain everything else. Consciousness is, is the primitive. It's the first and sole given fact of nature. Uh, uh, all other mysteries can be made sense of in terms of consciousness. But the moment you try to make sense of consciousness in terms of something else, that's the moment when you already went wrong. You can't keep on explaining one thing in terms of another forever. Otherwise, at best, you will uh, incur into circular reasoning. You explain A in terms of B, B in terms of C, and then C in terms of A. Did you explain anything? No, you have a circular argument that doesn't explain anything at all. Uh, eventually you hit rot, rock bottom in nature. You explain one thing in terms of another, you know, the body in terms of organs, organs in terms of tissues, tissues in terms of cells, those in terms of molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, feuds. At some point, this has to stop. You can't play this game of reduction forever. And my claim is consciousness is what you find at the bottom of this chain of reduction, this chain of explanation. And then, of course, you can't explain consciousness in terms of something else, because then you would go circular. Consciousness is what existence is. It's what the universe is. It isn't a mystery, and it doesn't need an explanation, because it's that in terms of which you explain everything else. The mystery of consciousness reflects a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding that consciousness is not primary but secondary, that it is a property or an effect of something else. That, that's the mystery. And then we go mm -hmm. and I'll hit our heads against the wall. How oh, we have to solve this mystery? No, you don't have to solve it. You have to see through it. You have to examine the unexamined assumptions that allowed you to interpret this as a mystery in the first place. Look, there are, there are many mysteries out there, many mysteries in nature, the mysteries of our behavior, the mystery of black holes and quasars, the mystery of quantum fields. There, there are many mysteries, but consciousness isn't one. Consciousness is that in terms of which we will solve all the other mysteries eventually. Cons consciousness is nature's given. It's the ground of everything. We are all consciousness, basically. And you cannot get to, to examine or to, to find, if you said if it is a mystery, and it's very clear it's not a mystery, you can't get out of consciousness at any time. So you can only explain something if you can step away from it, I, I guess. Yeah. But there is no way of us can step away from consciousness because it's just not possible. Exactly. And yet that's what Western neuroscience has been trying to do for decades now. I mean, it would be comical if it weren't tragical. And that uh, ties in well with this question about AI that's coming up here from 
uh, Darshan, we have a question from Sailash Scott 105 as well, and they're all talking about the same thing. So their question is uh, whether or whether not you would be going towards <laughs> AI now, and everyone's talking about moving forward. Is the AI ever going to be conscious? I think we have to make a strong difference between artificial intelligence on the one hand and artificial consciousness on the other hand. I think we will get to AI, artificial intelligence. In fact, to a large extent, we are already there. But what I mean is that we will get to artificial intelligence at, at and beyond human levels. But intelligence is a certain modality of information processing, of data processing. It is a functional thing. Uh, you can objectively determine if, if something is intelligent because we can watch how it performs its function. And some performances can be intelligent and some performances can be non-intelligent intelligent because they don't achieve their goals. So intelligence is objective, measurable, it is not a metaphysical issue at all. Uh, intelligence is a modality of data processing, information processing. Consciousness, on the other hand, is a metaphysical issue. It is not something you can measure. It's something that you can only become acquainted with. There is no consciousness meter. There are only meters of correlates of consciousness. Like there is this information integration theory of Giulio Tononi, uh, which allows you to look at certain patterns of brain activity that close loops and integrate certain amounts of information uh, that they can reduce to a number called phi. And if uh, phi achieves a maximum value, then that correlates with the metacognitive conscious experience. But what is being measured is a correlate of a particular modality of consciousness, in other words, meta-consciousness, uh, but it's not consciousness itself. Consciousness can only be known through first-person experience and not measured. So, uh, however, um, our culture, particularly in the West, has conflated these two things. We now think that consciousness and intelligence are the same thing, or at least are coupled in a very intimate way. Therefore, if, if something objectively expresses measurable intelligence, then we tend to assume that it's also conscious. In other words, that there is something it is like to be that thing, that the data processing is somehow accompanied by experience. But that's a flawed metaphysical assumption. Uh, first of all, it's certainly an assumption because intelligence and consciousness are, are per definition different things. Uh, one can be measured, the other cannot. One can be known from a third person perspective, the, only, the, the other only from a first person perspective. The fact that you have one doesn't mean that you have the other. There are conscious beings that are not intelligence. They're, uh, intelligent. There are intelligent computers that are not conscious in and of themselves. Uh, I see no reason to think a computer is conscious. Uh, um, because what they are doing is they are simulating certain patterns of brain activity, but the simulation is not the thing that is simulate, simulated. So, or like you said earlier, one comes from the other, but it can't go in the reverse. So, intelligence comes from consciousness, but uh, uh, consciousness cannot come from intelligence. The, the intelligence of, a, of an AI computer is the intelligence of its designers uh, that came from the consciousness of its designers. Well, you can even say the exactly. AI is more intelligent than the designers. You can say that. But ultimately, the AI is a product of the consciousness of its designers. Uh, I don't think consciousness can be created because I think it is the space wherein all creation takes place. Consciousness is the ground level of reality. It's already there from the beginning. You can't take a step before consciousness was there because consciousness is what there is. There is nothing that precedes it. So you can't create it. The only thing you can try to do is to create a artificial dissociation of universal consciousness. I think I am a dissociative pro processing universal consciousness. So are you, Joachim, and so are the listeners. Um, and those dissociative mechanisms that we are uh, have had a spontaneous uh, uh, birth, so to say. They were not artificially created. We were born from our parents and not artificially put together in a laboratory. I think we will get to a point where we can even artificially induce dissociation in universal consciousness. But that will be merely the creation of life from non-life. 
I think that would be abiogenesis, you know, when you create life in a laboratory. Can, do I think we can achieve that? I think we can achieve that. Eventually, we will achieve that. But what it will look like will be a bacteria or a metabolizing organism, not a silicon computer, because I don't think a silicon computer is what dissociative processes in universal consciousness look like from the outside. But silicon computers can definitely be intelligent, perhaps more intelligent than us. I think we will achieve even that. But that's a completely different thing than to talk about artificial consciousness or artificial dissociation. Mm. And in local language, you could call it fake consciousness. Yeah, look, there, there's even a metaphor I like to use. I, I, am a, I have a doctorate in computer engineering and I have worked in AI. So this is an area very close to my heart. Um, everything a computer does, and I can say this to you with authority, everything an electronic silicon computer does can be done in principle with pipes, taps, and water. Instead of uh, 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 copper wires, we have pipes. Instead of electricity, we, we have water. Instead of electronic micro switches, we have taps. But the computing process can be done with water, pipes, and taps. It's just that to, to, to create a powerful computer that way would require perhaps something the size of a country. So it's not practical, uh, it's not practically feasible, but in principle, computations can be performed with water pipes and taps, not only electricity, silicon, and, and micro switches. Uh, we use electricity, silicon, and micro switches because we can miniaturize that very effectively and therefore create a lot of functionality in a cheap, small amount of space uh, that we can sell for relatively uh, 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 low value. Um, that's why we do that. But then what happens is because everything is miniaturized and locked in into an epoxy package, it becomes mysterious. You don't know what's going on inside uh, uh, an integrated circuit, a, a, a silicon chip. It's a great mystery. And the human mind projects all kinds of things uh, onto a mysterious object. We, our minds fill in that space with our own projections. And what are we? We are consciousness. So what we project onto a mystery? Consciousness. That's why we think that a sophisticated computer that works in mysterious ways for us can be conscious because we are projecting our own consciousness onto that mystery beyond our understanding. But if you were to look at a construction of, uh, construction of pipes, flowing water, and gazillions of taps the size of a country, the size of the Netherlands, my country, you would never project your, your own consciousness on it because pipes, water, and taps are banal. They are not mysterious. You open and close a tap multiple times a day, every day. You splash water in your face every day. You see pipes uh, regularly. It's not a mystery. So you know that that thing is just coordinating the flow of water through certain pipes and certain valves. Uh, it performs computations. It can even be intelligent. It can be intelligent based on an objective definition of consciousness, it can solve problems in the same way that an old abacus performed calculations as well with moving pellets. Uh, but we would never project consciousness onto, onto that because it's by now and not mysterious. But the silicon computer has become so mysterious that we project ourselves onto it. If, we, if you knew the way I know after decades working in design and manufacturing of silicon computers, how it's actually done, you would hardly project that. Today, only people more oriented towards software in, in AI research uh, ha entertain this silly thought that an AI will be conscious. I think most hardware designers involved in the core manufacturing processes of a silicon computer, you know, in lithography, etching, doping, they know that we are dealing with metal and sand uh, in there, and that's all there is to it. It's hard for them to project consciousness onto it because they know what's going on. Uh, the projection only works when it's a mystery. The problem is computers are mysterious for the vast majority of people on Earth, and that leads to all kinds of nonsense because when it's a mystery, uh, you can, it becomes plausible. Anything is plausible in association with a mystery. Our sense of plausibility goes out the window, and that's the problem. You would have also heard what uh, probably Sam Harris is talking about, that 
he's afraid that we're actually go and this could be consciousness but we would be taken over by these ai beings now if you say they are not going to be conscious how could this go wrong and do you what is your take on this fact of all of us one day in the future we are going to be consumed by these robots who have gone rogue all of a sudden i i think this is a fairly independent issue um do i think we have reasons to fear um degrees of automation that would go beyond our ability to understand what's going on yes and i think that's independent of whether these mechanisms uh, are conscious or not i think uh, losing oversight of the functionality of the things we are building carries uh, inherent risks um, there was a time when i was a kid in the 80s one person could design a whole computer from scratch and then program it and understanding and understand everything that was going on there today you require many many thousands of people each one of them working on a tiny little bit of the whole thing and this process is accelerating so we are already at a point where no one person knows everything that needs to be known about how the technology we rest our lives upon uh, works uh, and, and, and that's a risk, especially when it comes to AI sorts of algorithms um, in which we don't program the functionality, we program a strategy for the machine to eventually reach the desired functionality. But how the machine actually uses that strategy and gets there is a black box for us. It, it is still completely mechanistic, it is still deterministic, uh, there is nothing mysterious going on there in the sense that it's mysterious in principle. No, but it, it is mysterious in practice because it's so complex that nobody has an overview of what's happening. It, it becomes a back, black box for each and every one of us as individuals. And then it can develop some aspects to its functionality uh, in a very mechanistic way, very dead, unconscious way, uh, that escape our ability to predict. And that's how things can go wrong, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, if, if people have concerns with automation that exceeds our oversight because it has become so complex that no one person can, can oversee it, I think those fears are, are legitimate. Uh, things can go wrong, they can stop working, uh, they, they can manifest behavior that was not predicted and not uh, specified during design because of the design strategies that we are using uh, uh, to, in order to create these complex uh, mechanisms. So the, 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 the concern is valid for all I know, but uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with these things being conscious. Uh, pro that's our own projection, projecting consciousness onto complex mechanisms is, is, is a psychological artifact of human beings. Even to talk about this technology as beings that will take over the planet already reflects uh, our projections. All we have here are very complex mechanisms that go wrong and we don't know why they go wrong. We can't fix them. That's the risk. That's all there is to it. It can kill us nonetheless, <laughs> but it's, it, it's, not, it's not mysterious at a fundamental metaphysical level. It just kills us. I mean, if your car misfunctions while you are going at 230 kilometers an hour in a, in a highway in southern Germany, uh, it will kill you. It's not alive, but it will kill you all the same. All right, you should right, be afraid right. of it. <laughs> and and if and if all the driverless cars decides to still uh, go wrong at a time or kill 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 a particular percent of people, it's chaos. I would say it's not uh, it's not anything else other than that. Exactly. It's complex technology that is deployed everywhere. So if it goes wrong, it has a high likelihood that it, that it will go wrong spectacularly because it's everywhere. Uh, so th that's Correct. all there is to it. I mean, uh, in, in, uh, decades ago, uh, your television could uh, produce what we engineers call uh, the, 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 the holy smoke. <laughs> <laughs> it can go yeah, wrong, a capacitor yeah. blows inside your television, it stops working, but the worst that happens is that your living room will have a bad smell and you have to dish out a few more dollars to, to get your television repaired. Now, if something goes wrong, because technology is so much more complex, mechanical, but so much more complex and far-reaching, if something goes wrong, planes fall out of the sky. Cars uh, crash into each other on the roads. Uh, 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 hospital equipment stops working. Loads of people die, but the, the, 
what is actually going on is the same. It's just deployed at a higher level of complexity. But it's still just like capacitors blowing on the back of your television and stinking up your living room with bad smoke. A nuclear facility leak that happened recently was one of those examples. So yes, we have to be careful about what we are playing with because at the end of the day, someone is going to drop the ball somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. or an algorithm will do something that was not specified in design. And it's so complex that nobody could predict that it would manifest that behavior under certain circumstances. And then a lot of things can go wrong. It's just very, 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 very complex televisions here. But televisions nonetheless, if you know what I mean metaphorically. Uh, so it's it's been really exciting talking to you. Uh, you've spent years talking to us now. I think we started talking a long, long time ago, Bernardo. And it's been such a pleasure. <laughs> but before, before we let you go, uh, a question that uh, I have kept for the end from Sister Tube, who asks you, what are the things that keep you up these days? What you have been discussing with us is pretty much what we have asked you. Right, so you being one of the that question that said the great minds of of the world, what what are the great minds of the world thinking and worried about today? Something that we have not thought of. I, I don't know what the greatest minds of the world are thinking about right now. I can tell you what I'm thinking about right now. What what worries me right now is that um, I see many signs that the collective human psyche, the collective human mind, particularly those layers that we rep repress and judge out of existence, there are energies in movement there at a level that has not been seen in two or three uh, generations, that has not been seen uh, in the lifetime of any one of us, perhaps only the oldest of us. Um, and I see tremendous seismic energies uh, in movement uh, there. And I see the signs of that. And I think we are in relatively shortly uh, for a time of uh, great tribulation in the world at, at many different levels, many, many different levels, geopolitical, cultural, scientific. Uh, and I'm not talking about COVID. COVID, I think, is the first spark of a, of a great fire. And, and this is not a prophecy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a prophet and I'm not, not prophesizing anything. This is just a guess from observation, uh, observation of our culture, uh, observation of the dynamics of the world. And what I fear is that we will not have the necessary equanimity as a culture to not judge what's going to happen. The, the important factor in our survival here is that um, you, know, you guys in India know this more than anybody else. Shiva is not something to be denied. Shiva is the god of destruction, but also the god of uh, uh, um, rebirth, the god of evolution in that, in that sense, getting rid of the old uh, in order to make space for something new, better, and healthier. And I think uh, Shiva is going to do his dance in a very conspicuous way um, in the next uh, several years. And it's important that we don't judge uh, in the sense of thinking of Shiva as the devil, as something that should be eliminated. It's important that we don't judge each other. It's important that we don't judge the process, uh, that we don't judge others that are going about it in the opposite way we would go about it. It's important that we don't judge ourselves, uh, first and foremost, that we just observe and accept that these are natural energies that are in movement now and will move the way they will move because that's how nature is. And nature expresses itself in all those different forms, many of which we would consider uh, destructive, evil, and rejectable and detestable. Uh, if we refrain from judging, uh, the process will cause the destruction that needs to be caused for a eventual rebirth. But if we judge it, we'll be throwing gasoline in the fire and then it might consume us. And there will be no rebirth because there is nothing for something to be born from. That is my personal uh, great fear for the next uh, times of tribulation. And what you just spoke about, is this consequential because of 
something done in the past or is this just a cyclic process? So irrespective of what we did, this, this would happen anyway. I, I think this is n nature. This is just nature. It's the nature of mind uh, to, to mobilize different kinds of its own energies uh, at different points in time, at different points in history. Uh, Hegel already articulated this process for the first time, this dialectical process of the collective mind or the absolute, as he called it. So the, 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 this is not something that we haven't been told happens. Uh, we just don't pay attention to it and we don't, don't pay attention to history. Uh, this kind of thing, thing has happened already, you know, from, from 1870 to 1945. Uh, this kind of thing w was happening. Uh, it started, well, it's kind of an European-centric perspective, but uh, so uh, apologies for that. But at least from a European perspective, this has happened before for, for, for seven decades. Um, and uh, I think it's just natural. It's mind waking up to itself and, and, and manifesting all the potentials of mind, uh, many of which uh, we consider detestable, evil, and... and, and, and and things that should be eliminated, or well, they can't be eliminated because they are part of what is going on. They are part of what nature is. So they have to express themselves. Uh, but the best way to go about it is to observe it with equanimity and refrain from judgment because judgment is what injects energy in that process, is what throws fuel in the fire. And then in instead of going through this cyclic spiral of, uh, of uh, uh, self-cognition, uh, we may uh, uh, kill the plant before it grows. And, and then we may have to start a process over. And eventually, it wouldn't be a problem. We start over again. Eventually, we'll get here again. But from our perspective within the process, that, will, that would be a pity, right? We would throw away the progress, progress we have already made because of our nasty tendency to judge everything that we repress in, within ourselves. Uh, we only see the repressed parts of ourselves uh, when they are projected onto the world around ourselves, which we then judge. Um, so, yeah, if I, if I can leave you with any message, it would be this. Um, times are changing. It, there will be tribulations. The important thing to do is not to say, oh, let's share the love, let's be kind to each other. It's all true, it's all good, but you know, priests have been promoting this forever. It never works. It never works to say this. It never works to say that we should all love each other. We should, but it doesn't work to say that. What might work is to say, shit is coming. Don't judge it. You know, Take a deep breath. Uh, uh, let's undergo this. This is just nature. Refrain from judging. And we will emerge on the other side and things will be better. Well, I will have to listen to that again. And I'm sure you've, you've put a lot in there. So, yes, thank you so much for the conversation you've had with us over the last, I think it's four hours now, uh, when we did get in touch with you. And uh, I, I, was, I, I was quite excited when you agreed to talk to us because uh, we are a, we are a uh, a podcast coming out of India here where we are trying to bring in a lot of uh, minds as well to influence kids in schools and colleges to understand themselves better, to choose careers better, to have a little bit more exposure to cultures from around the world as well. And I think the last four hours has just done exactly what we would have wanted to do. So we've really enjoyed our time. You've answered our questions. You've given me a lot to, because while I was talking to you, I was actually making a few notes. So a lot. Uh, so you've given me a lot of homework. When I'm sure a lot of my uh, our listeners, I would advise them to do the same. You know, make a few notes, and uh, uh, you don't have to go through this full four hours in sequence. You you can stop where you want to, get off the train, uh, <laughs> explore a little bit yourself, and then come back on because it's a journey. And I don't think four hours is uh, is enough to to cover what we try to cover, right? And I Hope, uh, Bernardo, you've enjoyed your time with us as well. I enjoyed very much, uh, Joaquim. For me, it's been a great honor uh, to, to have an opportunity to talk to India. Uh, I think after these four hours, it's obvious to every listener why I consider this uh, a great honor for me uh, personally. It's humbling. Um, thanks a lot for having me here. It's been very enjoyable, a very enjoyable marathon. <laughs> thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity, Joaquim. I really appreciate it.